Hey everyone, welcome to GM Genie. The channel gives you tips and techniques to take your game mastering game off out of the box and off the rails. See, as we're doing our first live cast, you can't always get it the first time. I'm here with Gareth Barrett from the DMG Info, YouTuber, publisher. Uh, I've been watching his content. How are you? <laughs> I've been watching Gareth's content on story structure, and so that's the next thing I'm exploring. It's the hardest part of game mastering for me. I wanted to bring in some advice. So uh, it's, the, it's the one thing that no one ever talks about in the game guides. Yes, there's. <laughs> I don't know if that's because it's the hardest thing to approach. I mean, you're certainly not writing a screenplay or a novel. Your your characters are much more volitional than that. Uh, but I feel like it's the most crucial, maybe the most important game mastering skill, because it, it's your players are either going to feel railroaded or not, at, depending how you write your outline. Absolutely. You, and that's, you know, part of my passion is that, um, you know, when I was writing 70 system is like a considerable portion of the book is about how to tell the story with the game. Um, you know, how you, how do you actually structure it? And it doesn't, doesn't necessarily need to be that specific game. It can be any role playing game, but you know, you're still going to need a structure because without yeah. a structure, it's basically like speaking without full stops, commas and exclamation points. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So um, that that might be uh, you might be anticipating the answer. My my first question is how do you how do you outline your adventures? Is there a is there a metaphor you kind of use to to picture the role of the outline? Well, um, you know, I I started doing this. Oh, it's going to be thirty years ago, um, and um, you know, the first game I was exposed to was D and D. Um, and that game was the very last time we played vanilla D and D. So we basically immediately changed the rules to our own way of doing things. Nice. Um, and because in South Africa, it was very difficult to actually acquire rule books and things like that at that time. Now it's a lot easier. Um, and we were 10 years, 11 years, 12 years old. Um, you know, parents were not going to go out and buy us these demonic tomes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we kind of, we, we, we patched together rules. So I've never, I've never really played vanilla, you know, like the vanilla rules. I've always been making up my own rules and f using friends rules and, um, playing Warhammer and then changing the rule. We, we actually played Warhammer for a while and we adapted we, we adapted the rules out of White Dwarf because we didn't have the rule book. So we looked at the battle reports and deconstructed what the rules should be from the battle reports, which were completely wrong. But, you know, um, but that comes to the point of, you know, where, how do you get into story structure? And story structure really for me is like the, the, the main tributary of how the whole thing actually runs because you're, you, you need this mechanism to, for people to be cooperative in doing something. Um, and, you know, if, if, if you didn't have the dice and you don't have any of these things, you'd probably just be people sitting around talking, right? But if you are people sitting around talking, you're telling stories and you're telling stories in a structure. So there's a lot of people like talk about, you know, agency and, and free will and, you know, just the DM shouldn't railroad and all these kind of things. And, and, um, when you sent me the questions, your question, you know, you, you're asking one later and it includes the word volition. Um, and that's a very important word. And we can talk about that when you ask that question. But it, it's really about choice and not necessarily about freedom. Um, and I think that's a very different dichotomy, you know, yeah, when you, exactly. you look, yeah, you're looking at that. Um, you know, and, and to me, that's when the, when the rules basically became when you fail a role it you now have another choice to make um oh. so failure is very important in terms of storytelling um you know you 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 as the dm are putting problems in front of the players and you, you know their success or failure creates different choices from the outcome of of that success or failure so um, failure might limit your freedom but it doesn't preclude choice Correct. Yeah, correct. Really so, good. and and a lot of people start to use the term railroading, which to me is like if the DM or the GM opens their mouth, they're railroading. Um, <laughs> you know, you can't you, you can't separate yourself from guiding the players through something, right? 
it's 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 pretty much that's what happens and and that seems to be an outlying opinion as to what what it is but when you think about it from a standpoint of choice rather than freedom um it makes a lot more sense what i'm talking about because you your tracks have a lot of different divergent paths that you can take and the create and the players can actually create their own divergent tracks and the gm can then you know go along those new tracks that the players have created but you're still you're still guiding them along certain events that are going to happen and as i as i started playing games um and reading more books and reading tolkien and all these kinds of things i i started to see narrative as the structure of choices and i've done my my first degree was in english language and literature psychology and economics so there's those are all choice based um uh, fields of study um, and then I did a, an honors degree in documentary film theory and, and um, practice Ooh. and a master's degree in narrative film theory and practice. So that's studying how films are put together, um, you know, the, the theory behind, you know, the editing style and choices that people make. Um, and uh, my, my actual master's thesis was on the universal structure of narrative which was heavily influenced by um, the works of, um, God, I'm terrible with names, but um, The Hero's Journey. Um, I'm sure you, yeah, Joseph Campbell. Now there was also um, The Writer's Journey, which was a subsequent book written um, by someone in Hollywood, which uh, sort of took that and applied it to films, uh, retrospective of, of, of um, Star Wars, but then sort of, and that, changed the way hollywood viewed the structure of their narratives and that's what's led to like the blockbuster films um and some will say that it's a bad thing and some will say that a good thing and then you've got satine phoenix just wrote the heroine's journey which is the female perspective of the hero's journey um i haven't read that yet um but i'm intrigued by that because yeah. i mean obviously i'm a male so my perspective is a masculine perspective um and so it's it'll be interesting to see that from the female perspective but yeah that's so i kind of grew from gaming and telling stories into studying stories and sort of then looking back and seeing what i'd actually done on that journey and then now you've written 7d system which it was what made me notice your channel uh was you have these uh this story structured guide and it's in this it's in this pdf you sent. that's right Love. They can download that from 70system.com. So that, yeah, that is that is basically my role-playing interpretation of the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously there's more to it than just what you see there. Um, and on questgivers.com, we have this one, which is how to, how to run a successful role-playing campaign, um, which that breaks down those squares and what they mean and then goes into a little a little bit further but 70 system is takes that and you know blows it out of 40 pages you know um and and goes a lot more into detail and scene and transition structure and all that kind of stuff yeah definitely go check that check out that uh how to run a successful campaign that's it's a lovely pdf um so so structure exists. Are you saying that um, it kind of sounds like you're saying we shouldn't be afraid of railroading because railroading is a curtailment of freedom, not of choice. Correct. So for instance, if you, if you run a dungeon, right, yeah. you have railroaded because it's underground and they can't walk through the actual earth. Yeah. You've created corridors and you, you have railroaded, whether you're a, a non-railroading DM, a sandbox DM, or whatever you by doing that you've done that. If you create a town um, and you give it a name, you you you've if, you know, and you say it's set in farmland, you, you've it's you've defined something. Um, you've defined the the boundaries by which this is in, encapsulated, and that's why I say railroading is really the wrong term. Um, it's I only say railroading because it's the thing that everyone grabs onto. Um, and it's the controversial term, and I'm trying to deconstruct that into it's not, you know, people are running away and running, you know, running games where there's absolutely no structure to anything. And I've played in those, I've played in those games, and they are awful. They are like they get boring very, very quickly because the player doesn't know what to do. <laughs> this I've, is the problem. 
I've done it uh, trying to get away from railroading. It doesn't doesn't work. Uh, So my, the whole agenda on my channel is to try and figure out what is, what are the things that you should railroad for lack of a better term? And what are the things that you shouldn't, how do you know the difference when you're laying your adventure out and when you're at the table? I guess, so I guess that's, that's two separate questions. Maybe you should always be giving the players the choice. So if you're not giving them a choice, then that's bad. So you say you walk into the tavern and start fighting an orc. Um, You know, you walk into the tavern and you see an orc. And then the question goes, and then the person goes, okay, well, is the orc angry? Is he happy? Is he asleep? You know, and then you give a little bit more description. He looks angry and he's drawing his sword. Um, You know, then... So then the player can make a choice. Do they want to run away? Do they want to attack the orc? These are the sort of things that you'd... Um, you walk into a tavern, is railroading, right? Okay, by the classic, oh my God, you told them they could. They walked into a tavern, you didn't give them a choice to do that. But it's like you're setting the scene, you yeah. know? Um, you, you know, it's like they decided to go to the tavern and then you start with, you walk into the tavern. Um, so your description is is vital in terms of setting up the player choice because when you describe something the player needs to be able to actually set a goal for what it is their character is going to do in the scene so if you if you speak for 30 minutes describing the scene and all this kind of thing you know you're creating so many goals that the character doesn't know what to do or if you just tell them you go into the you start attacking this orc and you've you've struck the first blow you gave them no choice in that scenario now they're just going to roll dice for combat um, there are people who love that, <laughs> you know, that's very board gamey. Um, but you know, or, that's, or unless that's his everyday life, like a James Bond opening always happens while he's fighting some, some random bad guys blowing things up and that, and you, but there's choices, there can be choices within that setup. I guess it would just depend who the character is. That's right. I, I'm well known for starting in the middle of chaos. So, yeah. you know, my adventures always start, you're hanging on the edge of, of, the uh, the trap or you're uh, the one i was just communicating with one of my um uh, patreon supporters you know in the game he played in he was a single player and he started underwater drowning um so he had no choice in the fact that that's where he began but all his choices fed from that point so there was no freedom in terms of where he started from but there was a mountain of choices that opened up you know once he got to the surface because he doesn't really have a choice he doesn't want to just okay are my characters just going to drown i mean no one's going to say that right everyone's going to fight for breath and so you can you can as a dm create choices where you know to some extent what the outcome is going to be but you don't want to limit choices where it's only ever going to be one outcome um so you you know so what I just did there with the drowning, um, you know, there is only one outcome from that, but this is the very first thing that happens. So he emerges from the water and then he sees there's a whole bunch of uh, lizard men on the bridge that are trying to attack him. There's a, an embankment to the one side. There's a forest to the other side. I'm now giving him three or four different choices to, to, to make it. Determine. I don't know which way he's going to go. Right. But I, with my setting the scene, I set the scene and then he has several different goals he can create. Do I continue down the river? Do I swim to the one side where there's just an embankment? Do I swim to the forest? Do I watch the guys on the bridge? What are they doing? You know, there's a variety of options that they have. Um, And when you as the DM create a good setting, so so setting the scene and you do it succinctly with uh, three or four juicy goals, um, the players are going to be more invested in what it is that you're that you're presenting to them um and their choices although they have limited freedom in terms of they can't just fly <laughs> um they they have limited freedom they have multitude of choice so um that's where there's kind of the difference between player agency as freedom and player agency as volition yeah. because volition is is really what it is um and not um, player choice, uh, player agency in terms of the freedom to just do whatever. Hmm. So, so we got four terms. So we got choice and freedom and volition and agency. How do, how do those? How do well, you- agency is their ability to um, adapt the environment to their 
character or way of doing things. Um, but l let's say, for instance, you get married. That's a, that's a choice that limits your freedom. You're no longer single. You can't just go out and party all the time, right? You're married. Then you decide to have kids. So that's limited your freedom even further. The two of you can't go out on a date every single evening. You know, to you, you now have to look after the children. You've made these choices that have limited your freedom, but you still have a significant amount of agency in terms of all the choices that you have, even though your freedom has been limited. So, you know, that that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, it, it, you know, it's because not a lot of people actually talk about this in terms of actual role playing games because everyone you know the big thing is everyone um, players must have agency the players must be able to describe absolutely everything and create all the characters and do all the things it's like well why is the dm or the gm there are they just there to roll the dice for the monsters that the characters create or you know um, they're there to provide the structural framework for everything to happen that's my point of view and uh, some people will say that's raid railroading i just say it's a structural framework for people to actually make choices and decisions for their characters. I feel like it's the game master's or the game master's role is to it's to move the game from periods where the players are creating something to periods where um, the the game master is by narrator fiat moving the story. Almost it, and it's almost a um, the game master takes a turn and then the, the players take a turn even though it won't be yes marked that way well the the the, well, the, the, the go ahead sorry no you sorry i'm interrupting you well the hard part for me is to know when how do you know if we're picturing it as game master turn player turn players turn how do you know when the turn switches there is no um dm turn because the dm reacts on every single turn so it's player dm player dm player dm player dm so um if you're looking at a strict turn order the gm goes every single with every single character there's a reaction from the gm well i'm i guess i'm talking more about in story where if they're oh, okay assessing what they want to do next and then the player adapts that situation so players is more yeah so so the gm goes okay there's going to be a bad guy who's going to steal something from them and the players can you know if they want it depends on how much leeway you're going to give the players but the players can tell you what the bad guy looks like and you know what kind of armies he has but that doesn't stop the fact that there is a bad guy who wants to steal something from them um you 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 that's the structure that you control as the gm Whereas the players can, can, can control theme and can control um, descriptions of different things. So I've done it in a few games where a player will walk into a room and I say, okay, describe the room. And they say, okay, um, well, it's a bedroom and there's a window and there's, a, you know, whatever. And then, and then someone might say, and there's a lady lying on the bed. So I'm like, okay. The lady on the bed jumps up and says, oh, who the hell are you coming into my bedroom and covers herself up? They didn't create that. I created that because I control the NPCs, but they created the room. They created the woman. They created the window. And now they have goals. Do they jump out the window? Do they leave the room? Do they interact with the woman? But I'm reacting. And part of it is the role of the GM DM is you are basically, when the players have created goals, you are, um, the one who makes problems that sit between them and their goal. So you you create barriers and problems that they have to solve as the character. So their characters are a collection of stats that solve problems, you know, strength, dexterity, spells, whatever. And you put problems in front of them that they have to solve to achieve their micro goals they're setting in every single scene. Um, Obviously, some goals might be where you're not using stats, but they're narrative goals. So you want to get information out of a character. So they may not roll anything, but they'll ask a whole bunch of questions. And when players are asking questions um, and you are giving answers, you are building the world around them. So, um, you know, again, people will say it's railroading and the character should be answering these questions, but there's some questions they can't answer. That's why they're asking the questions. Right. <laughs> Is... um. What it's so something I toy with creating every once in a while, and maybe this is overkill, but it, it doesn't exist yet to my knowledge. It is 
some kind of a flow chart that tells you when to railroad and when to yield the floor. And maybe a flow chart is not the right tool for that. Maybe it's something you just have to feel out. But I feel like game mastering is kind of restricted right now to people who have an inherent, who have an intuition about when to railroad and when to yield the floor. There's not, I haven't seen literature telling you, here's when you do it. Um, and I want to open the hobby to people who don't intuitively have that skill, but who have stories that they want to tell. A lot of players are not people who want to sit around telling stories. They want to roll dice and have fun. Yeah. Um, so it's a group by group, player by player specific thing. And that's why it tends to be intuitive. What yeah. I try to do is look at it from a structural perspective, which helps in both, you know, people who who want the players to to describe things and people who want to do the classic railroad where the players have absolutely no choice and they just want to roll dice, which is more a board game than it is, you know, a role playing game. But in both senses, you still have structure. You have loose structure and you have severe structure and you're kind of a, a spectrum of the two. And you as a GM and your group and your players fall somewhere on that spectrum. And you've got to learn to when to move that needle. Um, but what I try to do with 70 system and what we do with quest givers uh, with my friend DM Scotty from the DMs craft is we, we like to put out a lot of options so that when cra when players um, go off the rails, <laughs> you have other things that you can throw in there or use or whatever. So um, the classic example in, in the terrain community that I'm in is like people will build a specific set piece of terrain that they're going to, the characters are going to end up at, right? And then the characters decide to go in a completely different direction. And this castle you've been spending six months on building, they never get to. So in that sense, a lot of people try to railroad them back to the castle <laughs> you know, and that's where it becomes problematic. Um, so it, it's it's difficult to say this is when you should do it, and this is because it's you know it's it's a group by group, player by player um, situation. But very definitely, when you think about it structurally in terms of setting the scene, creating, allow the players to set goals for the scene, have some minor problems that become you know that get in the players ways because you don't want the players to always be getting everything that they want because that again will be boring you know um it's like almost like make a quest out of everything if they want to go and open a chest you by locking the chest you're making a quest out of opening the chest mm -hmm. um because now they've got to go and find the key or they've got to find someone to pick the lock or they've got to find a tool to break open the chest you you've created a quest around a small little thing you you, the goal is to open the chest. You say, right, you open the chest. What was the point? <laughs> Why did you have the chest there in the first place? The content should have just been lying on the floor. Um, you know, um, so, I mean, that's just a very simplistic example, but it, it's used to illustrate that, you know, th this is really what it is, is about giving them these choices and then throwing in minor problems that they then have to use their character skills and abilities and or their player abilities in terms of you know acting or whatever to then move things forward hmm. i don't know if i can follow that <laughs> well i mean you for, so for instance if no, you I were doing a complete, I, I don't i don't yeah. know if I add anything to it yeah yeah i mean just for anyone else's watch it's just it's like if you've got um, if you're doing a complete sandbox, right, and the DM basically almost says nothing in the game, you know, the players are creating their own problems, you know, because the, they'll need to do checks to do things, right? Yeah. But on the other end of the scale, you've got the railroad system where it's like there's a locked chest roll for pick locking. You fail, right? That's, you know, you know, on to the next thing. Um, and, and the player has absolutely no say in it. Right. Um but this the same sort of structure still lies there. You've still got the goal. You've still got the the the, the little problem you've put in, and you you know you've still got the resolution of that. So, if there was one tip to take away uh, for somebody who's outlining outlining an adventure, um, 
it's kind of trying to decide what do you what do you write without overwriting it uh, with wanting to avoid writing things you're never going to get to because a player choice sends you off in a different direction right away and also not wanting to write something that that the players are going to want to to have freedom that you may not know ahead or choice rather you may not realize ahead this is a choice your players are going to want and now you're stuck with the thing that you outlined that uh that you now can't use i i guess i'm from my from myself and i think from other game masters it's a, a struggle to when you have a story to know which parts of it to write down and which parts of it to leave as choices because you're not going to follow a standard outline structure it's going to it's going to have railroad and player freedom and railroad and player freedom um that, I, yeah take. so yeah. you've got that sheet there so if you hold that up um the so i don't know if it's gonna so no, normally with hangouts it'll default to the person who's talking so um so that structure guide is one page and it's one page for a very specific reason so that you can't go overboard yeah come check um, this out while i while i talk and it brings the camera over to me there you have all of the elements of a, of a good adventure laid out on this sheet. Probably can't see them on the screen, but go to... Um, and you'll you'll notice that there's no sort of arrow, go here, then here, then here. It's kind of like there's a bubble behind it that connects them because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's loose, but it's an event-driven system. So you're basically defining certain events that are going to happen. Like, for instance, someone is going to run into town and say there's witches in the forest. They can do that in the tavern. They can do that in the healer's hut. They can do that in the castle. They can do that wherever. But that event is going to happen. Yep. So it doesn't matter where the players are. They could be having their um, hair cut in the hair salon and a person bursts in and says, there's witches in the forest, blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, there you, 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 you're utilizing those points Um but it's the idea is to be very succinct. You just need to drop certain information that will intrigue the players. Um, and we did a video on this in Quest Givers about you know um, the you know how to write a great hook. And there's only three things you need in a great hook. Um, and there's actually a, a booklet coming out on our website called the Plot Hook Formula, which is three plot. There's three things to every plot hook, and that is that you need. Um, a moral imperative, um, duty, and consequence. So there's a moral imperative to what it, what the hook is. There's a duty to it, and there's a consequence if they do or do not um, take the hook, right? Now, you only need to hit one of those three, but the best hooks hit all three. Um, because then, no matter if the person's evil and they're only in it for themselves, the consequence of not doing it and not getting the treasure is a motivator for them to do it. If they're playing a character that's, you know, a paladin and they want to save all the people from evil, they're going to take the moral imperative. If they're playing a fighter who, you know, is uh, has sworn to uphold the law, you know, witches are, you know, they're they're operating outside the law and they're doing bad things. They need to be brought to justice or whatever. So that brings duty into it. So if you have a character that hits all three, that's fantastic because they'll want to do it three times over. Um, so that is important in terms of you know considering how you would motivate the plot hook but you can also do that with goals as well when you're doing each scene you can you, there's there's consequences there's duty there's moral imperatives etc in, in even the micro goals in certain scenes but you do, it, not everything needs to be all three but the main plot hook yeah. does because that's the motivator that's going to drag them through the entire quest um whether that is exactly what the actual thing is or if it's just what it appears to be it does you know it doesn't need to be that's what it is but it it needs to appear to be that thing in order to motivate the players to move to the next event and your events are kind of uh, the way you've got them laid out here is more like a to-do list than an outline like you got correct your book your clock your uh choice and your mentor that all like you said happen need to happen in the beginning a few sessions regardless of what the players are doing and i think that's a really yeah. good way it out and it's not just in in the sessions but in the actual in, in each session so each session is laid out that way and the whole campaign is laid out that way uh, so yeah. yeah i like that uh uh-huh it's um and that's i think is a learned skill is uh, to be that flexible 
because you have a scene you have a scene you've written and you pictured it happening a certain way it it takes a certain it takes kind of a next level of thinking to realize when something else is happening on the table that it could be time for this scene that you hadn't envisioned this way what i normally suggest to people especially new gms is take your favorite movie and run that change the locations change the character names but the story is the same yeah. um so those events that happen in the story need to happen you look at that at that sort of narrative guide and you go okay what are the what are these things in that movie that i love put those into that structure and then change the names change the situation so if it's in space set it in fantasy so you can do that like you know i've run star wars 30 or 40 times as different games completely different characters you know um no one realizes it because once you've su successfully sort of massaged the, the 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 character names and everything there's very few people who will recognize it for what it is indiana jones is a great one to do as well you know um the you know the whole rolling ball trap instead of it being a rolling ball it's a sliving blade trap. you know they're not going to know um yeah. So, you know, and you as the DM, it's fun because you get to, you know, you'd be deconstruct your favorite film and then make them do that. <laughs> yep. Yep. Love it. It's, uh, it's, you know, back, back to the hero's journey, which is, yeah. uh, you know, maybe not as, maybe not as crucial reading for game masters as it is for novelists and screenwriters, but it's, uh, I feel like it is a, an enriching read just for a human being. <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah it's just i mean it, it 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 you actually start to look at your life in a different way in terms of what's happening you know because your life is structured in in a similar sort of way um yeah. you know and, uh, and then you're like holy crap i'm at this point <laughs> all <laughs> and right and you realize you know i need that mentor i haven't had that mentor character yet and you know well it's good too when you're passing through the abyss yeah <laughs> well this has been great gareth thanks so much for coming yeah. on no worries so yeah, um, everyone should uh, subscribe to GM Genie if you haven't watched. There's a great, my personal favorite video is that five um, components of the, the DM needs to know um, by is Aristotle, wasn't it? Yes, yes. And this will be uh, component number two, arrangement. Let's go in and play. Yeah. So yeah, you, the um, that's my favorite video. The only thing is I think you need to change the title and it should say, um, Dungeon five, the only five dungeon master skills you need from 700 BC. <laughs> it's an intriguing title and it kind of hits everything you need to know. In, it's got all your keywords and everything in it. And, you, and you ch change the thumbnail to have Aristotle on you pointing at going. <laughs> or Aristotle holding a Dungeons and Dragons book instead of the poetics. That's right. That's a good, <laughs> well, you have more subscribers than I do. I, I think I'll take that advice. Small insider tip. <laughs> Well, all right. Well, thanks again, Gareth. Uh, go check. No I put the links in the description for Gareth's uh, channels. One of them about game mastering. One of them, one of them specifically about the Seven B system. Go check them both out. And uh, hope we can do this again, Gareth. Yeah, I'm sure we will. <laughs> see ya. All right. See ya.